Here we are at Kanye Lake Veterinary Clinic again, as we are many times doing programs for Armstrong. And we're doing a program today entitled Allergies. And why did you pick allergies? Because we've talked about several topics in mm -hmm. the past. Allergies are a, a really common problem um, in pet dogs and cats too. But um, it's very common for us to see a dog with allergies come in, you know, very regularly. So it's a, a problem that a lot of people um, are having to deal with and it's not very straightforward. There's lots of different causes, lots of different tests, lots of different treatments. So, um, you know, when you bring your dog in and that's a, a possibility, it, you know, it's kind of like we're throwing a ton of information at you all at once. So I thought it would be a good thing to talk about because it is so common and there's so much involved with it. First question, is it more common in some breeds more than others? Uh, yeah, we do see, you know, some breeds more predisposed to having certain types of, of allergies. A lot of my friends have Goldens, mm -hmm. and they tend to always are dealing yeah. with that stuff and yeah. trying to change this and change that, and the ears are red, and the ears yep. are sore, and this, that, and everything else. So that, is there other breeds that are, are more, more Yeah, more Goldens, um, Pit Bulls really? seem to have okay. a lot, um, the Staffordshire Terriers. Um, labs, um, and then I see a lot of like little dogs with it, okay. like Shih Tzus and Chihuahuas and things like that. Let's hope not, since I have one of those. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the different types of allergies. Yeah. What are they? So there's many, uh, many different types. Um, there's kind of three big classes that we think of. The okay. first is environmental allergies. So that's things that are kind of in the air. The, the fancy word for it is atopic dermatitis. Uh, or atopy, you might have heard it referred to as well. But these are environmental allergens. So these are things like pollens, um, so things coming out of the trees. Um, so we'll often see seasonality to things like that. So the dog is fine, you know, 75% of the year, but then come summer transitioning into fall, they break out with all sorts of, of problems. Is that in the same category as um, the grass? Yeah, and so grasses, you know, trees, anything that, you know, is making a pollen could do it. Mm -hmm. um, the most common environmental allergy is actually dust mites. And so a lot of people will say, well, you know, my dog only gets or is itchy year round. It must not be environmental. But the dust mite is the most common environmental allergy, and dust mites are everywhere all the time. And so. In our homes, too. Exactly. Primarily in our homes? It, just they're all over. Every yeah, place. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. So environmental is the first choice. Right. Um, and so dust mites, things from plants, those are kind of the big ones in, in that category. Okay. Um, the next uh, category would be a food allergy. Um, and this is kind of uh, an area of, of hot topic because um, you see all the different diets and sure. stuff out there. Um, all the, or most of the research that's been done suggests that it's the protein in the food that the dog is having an allergic reaction to. So chicken, pork, beef, fish, those types of things. And that'll come important later when we start talking about, you know, diagnostics and treatment for that particular type of allergy. Um, as far as I know, there's only been one study, and it was decades ago, that showed a, a gluten or a wheat allergy, and it was in a, a very isolated group of Irish setters, I believe it was. Um, so there hasn't really been anything to, to show that. Um, that being said, I have people that say they switch to a, a grain-free grain food, free. and their dog does better. So mm -hmm. I can't totally discredit it, but as far as the data that we have, that hasn't been shown. So most commonly, we're talking about the proteins that the dog is allergic to. We've talked about dog foods in the past, but mm -hmm. are there things that people should generally look for or try and avoid, or look, or actually look at their dog food package and see if there's something on there? What would be something they would say, oh, gee, that might be it. Maybe I should consider that. It, the, the protein is kind Proteins. of the big one. So okay. that, you know, when you come in, uh, you can say, well, you know, his, his dog food is beef based. And so we at least have like that to go on. Okay. That doesn't tell us that that's the allergy. We'll get how we figure that out in a minute, but at least we have that piece of information. Does the average person know? I mean, like you're- Like you're, what's in the dog food? I have no idea. Yeah, I, It's like 50-50. Like some people yeah, know right I off the no bat clue. and they'll be like, oh, it's, uh, you know, some like random duck from some random right. place with, you know, yams and brown rice. Right, and they'll say, well, my dog, my, my dog's allergic to whatever, so my, my dog is on, on potatoes and some other combination. I say, how do you know that? And I know that there's one dog food that I use a lot. If you go to their website, there's got to be 25 different ones they make. You can say, mm -hmm. well, maybe I want the fish, or maybe I want the potatoes, or maybe I don't want the potatoes, and maybe I want... Yeah. It's like a, it's like a game of Russian roulette or right. something until you figure out what one it is. Yeah. Okay, so we've got, let's go back. We've got environmental, mm -hmm. 
And then we've got yeah. food. Food. What's another uh, one? The next, uh, flea allergies, um, and that's a common one that we see. So an animal can, can have fleas and have some hair loss and maybe some scabs and be a little itchy um, without having an allergy to the flea. Uh, an animal with flea allergy is just going to have itchy skin everywhere. They're tearing themselves apart. So it's a much more dramatic reaction to the fleas um, that, you know, tips us off to the allergy. Well, and this is... Can that have something to do with the fact that they're either on flea medicine or they're not? Yeah, and so an animal with flea allergies should really be on a flea preventative year-round. And, and the big difference is, you know, the, the dog that comes in with a ton of fleas and has some hair loss and itching, that's because it has a ton of fleas. The dog with a flea allergy, you know, you maybe we're combing them, we find one flea or a little bit of flea dirt, but there's not a huge flea burden yet they're red everywhere, they're itchy everywhere, there's scabs all over the place, they're itching all the time. So it's a much more dramatic response to a much smaller population of flea infection. Can a dog be allergic to the flea medication? Uh, there, is, that not, is that pretty rare? Uh, some dogs seem to have um, some reaction to it, you know, mm -hmm. like they get a little hair loss at the spot or a little redness. It, it's uh, I would definitely say it's not super common, but it, we do hear it from time to time, okay. and so we have to switch to, to a different one, which kind of leads us into our next topic, which is contact allergies. So that's, you know, things that they're exposed to that trigger an allergy. Uh, we don't see very many of those. A lot of people think like poison ivy and stuff like that would trigger, but dogs usually don't get that. They can transmit it to us, like if they go run through poison ivy. If it's under coach, you can get it, right? It, 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 yeah, if the um, oils, no, but, story. but they tend to not, you know, get things like that. But there are some things that can cause a contact allergy, uh, but we don't see it very often. What's most common then? For allergies? Right. Uh, environmental and food, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then you could, uh, as far as you know, allergies go, you could say like allergic reactions to like medications and things, but that's a, a totally different type of reaction that's yeah. happening in the body. We're kind of focusing on like the itchy skin, the ears, those types oh, of things. Today. Right. And that's what everybody's dealing with. Yeah. And of course, right now we mm -hmm. had it this summer. I, you know, some people said this summer what it's been. It's been a dry summer. Mm -hmm. So my dog is licking their feet, and it must be allergic. Or it's been extremely wet. Or it's, there's yellow stuff on the ground all the time. I mm -hmm. go out in the morning and I look at the dog's water dish and there's yellow pollen. So obviously it's got to be on the grass. Mm -hmm. gets in their feet. They lick their feet. Now we've got something crazy going. Right. right. Okay. Let's talk about the signs of it. Yeah. And so um, uh, especially like with environmental allergies, like a lot of people equate it to human allergies. So mm -hmm. a human with an environmental allergy to like pollens or grasses or whatever, they get watery eyes, they're sneezing. It's more like upper respiratory types of things. Okay. Dogs don't get that. They get skin problems from environmental allergies, food allergies, and flea allergies, and contact allergies. They don't get the watery eyes and all that stuff. Exactly. And so um, we see more skin problems. And so this can be um, uh, continuous, constant, or recurring episodes of dermatitis or inflammation of the skin. So the skin is red and kind of raw looking, it's itchy. Um, they might get uh, recurring ear infections, that's a common mm -hmm. one. Uh, and so they get an ear infection, we treat it, it clears up, and then two months later they have another one, we treat it, it clears up, you know, a month later they have another one, and it's just kind of like this pattern. Well, it, let's go back to the skin for a second. Mm -hmm. What about the skin as far as the short-haired dog and the long-haired dog? Uh, I mean, my dog, I've got one of each. Yeah. Well, I've got actually two of each. But I, I would see it probably on the belly or something of uh, my um, lasso or something like that, but with my collie, I'd have to be digging in right. there in the fur. A lot yeah. of times, I, do we miss that as, as I, owners? People tend uh, to notice the itching more, like the dog's sitting there, you know, like scratching right. and chewing at its feet and licking its feet, chewing on its belly, scratching its armpits. They tend to notice that more. And then if, you know, if it's easy to see, they can see the redness and the it's scabs. It's usually redness and, and scabs. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, so we've got the skin and so we've got the ears. Yeah, and the, the ears, ears. Are, the ears are basically an extension of the skin, mm -hmm. right? It's just the skin kind of going inward into the head. And so all those same signs that you see on the rest of the body, the rest of the skin, you can see in the ears too. So redness, itching, scabs, infection, 
so on and so forth. If it gets into the ears, will it travel further down the ear canal or does it tend to stay mostly on the outside? It usually stays the mostly ear. on the outside. The outer, okay. um, if the eardrum were to say a rupture or something, then the infection could spread inward, but that usually doesn't happen. Usually if the eardrum is rupturing, it's infection coming out. Um, and that's a whole other. Well, yes, because I've had the issues where uh, with my dogs, um, if they're itching, I lift up the ear and mm -hmm. for what it's worth, smell it. Yeah. And if it's got that terrible, terrible odor to it, I say, uh oh, we're in trouble here. Yeah. And that's usually something that's not usually from the allergies. That's usually a step beyond that, correct? Right. And so, um, you know, the, the redness, the itching, that's all inflammation right. that's okay. happening. And then there's normally, you know, bacteria and yeast on the skin. Mm -hmm. Those are microorganisms, and they're there in a, a small population. They help fight off, you know, bad bacteria, and, and they're just a part of our normal flora. Well, once all that inflammation and stuff starts happening, it kind of changes the microclimate of, of the skin and the ears. And so those bacteria that are normally there in small numbers can start kind of overpopulating right. because the, the environment changes and it favors their reproduction. So mm -hmm. then that's where we run into skin infections. So you might see pustules or hot spots, uh, and that's where the ear infections come into. Hot spots have nothing to do with allergies. They can be secondary to allergies. Oh, okay. So that's something a lot of us deal with too. Yeah, and so it's there's an area of itching or irritation, inflammation, mm -hmm. and the dog just keeps focusing on that and keeps chewing at it, and that creates that hot spot. Oh wow. Okay, so we're going back to the signs. Mm -hmm. We did the skin, and we've talked about the ears. Yeah. Where else? Uh, I mentioned licking feet already. That's a common one. Chewing at the feet. Chewing the feet. Um, they can be chewing at their back end, uh, like the the anal glands need expressed. You know, something like that. Um, and the licking of the feet, uh, some people report it more like after their dog comes inside. Like the dog comes in, their feet aren't wet, you know, their feet aren't muddy, but they're just sitting there chewing. And so uh, in lighter coated animals, white coats, you know, things like mm -hmm. that, you might notice staining of the fur around the feet or other areas where they're chewing. From the saliva. From the saliva. And so it kind of turns the white hair like a rust color almost. Right. I, uh, yeah, or like a, a brownish that. color. I swear um, to God, everything we talk about with my, one of my four <laughs> dogs has it at some point. Okay, what else happened? And, and then the licking of the feet. That's the big. licking of the feet is a big one. Um, and uh, for some of the food allergies, we can see gastrointestinal signs too. So uh, like intermittent diarrhea, soft stools, uh, things like that. Um, and so that can go along with everything That can be else. allergies? Mm-hmm. Food allergy. Huh, okay. Now I'm thinking about what else I'm doing. Yeah. About. Now I've also seen um, like environmental allergies where the dog is like so itchy and so stressed and just feels so awful from being itchy all the time that they actually like get an upset stomach and, and vomit and don't want to eat but that's just because like this they just feel so miserable right. from the skin I mean if you think about like having poison ivy or like chicken pox or something oh, yes. you know and chicken just pox. like magnify that you know to this just intense itching response all over the body like it just it has to be miserable that would be tough. And then you can, it's hard to put mittens on if you want to Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what they do with kids sometimes. Okay, well, how are we going to diagnose this? Now? Okay. Um, so we've talked about the different types of, okay. of allergies. And um, there's kind of a, a hierarchy to it as far as our diagnostics go. Because mm -hmm. some are more easy to diagnose than others. Um, so flea allergy, that's super easy to diagnose. If there's fleas on the dog and you have a big, big allergic response, you have to consider that. And so the first step is um, doing tests that rule out any sort of infection. An infection can be infection with fleas, infection with yeast, infection with bacteria, whatever it may be. Um, a lot of times when we say infection, we just think bacteria, but mm -hmm. it applies to all of those other things. So you're gonna notice that we go through with a flea comb and do like a lot of searching for um, any, any fleas or flea dirt that might be there. Flea dirt is flea poop, basically. And how did, what does that look like? It looks like little black uh, flecks and you can distinguish it from regular dirt by wetting it down on like a paper towel and kind of smearing it out. If it's regular dirt, it's gonna stay like a black brown color. If it's flea dirt or flea poop, it's gonna turn red when it gets wet because the flea eats a blood meal from the animal, it digests it and digested blood is black but then when you wet it again, it'll turn red. Okay, try this again. Tell me this again now. So I see this on my dog, uh -huh. and I see this yeah. black, and what are we gonna do? Because I thought this was, you were going, I was with you for a moment there, and I thought, <laughs> whoa, 
I think everybody probably missed that. So what we do is we get like a little flea comb. Um, we, we get a bunch of, you know, fur off. Okay. And then we put it on like a paper towel. All right. And then we just take some alcohol or water oh. and wet it down. Can it be water too? Or it just... can be water okay. too, All yeah. Right. And then you're just going to like streak it out. Like push on it. You All know, right. with like the back of the comb or with your fingers, with your nail. Sorry about that. It happens all the time. Okay, that, that won't happen again. People and are really going to be on my case about that. Okay, go ahead. Silence your cell phone. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so when you streak it out, if it's regular dirt, like from your dog rolling around right. uh, from the ground, that type of dirt, when you, when you squeeze it and streak it, it's going to stay a dark brown or a black. Okay. Okay. If it's flea dirt or flea poop, it's going to turn red. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. And it turns red because... Um, flea dirt is flea poop, so they, the flea takes a blood meal. They, right. they suck blood from the dog, mm -hmm. or the cat, or rabbit, ferret, whatever. Right. They digest it, and digested blood, whether it's in a flea or a dog, uh, is black. Okay, so that's why you know we always ask, like, are there any changes to the color of your dog's stools? Because if it's black, that means there's bleeding in the GI tract. So the same principle applies to the flea. They're eating blood, so their poop is black. But then when you wet it down, it's going to turn red. Oh, wow. I never, I've never known that. Fun fact. Fun fact? <laughs> My heavens. Too much of a fact, actually. So um, that's, that's usually the first thing that we do. Um, from there, um, we like to do some form of cytology, which is looking at samples under the microscope. Because remember, um, we're going in our hierarchy. So first, we want to rule out any infection before we jump on the food allergy or okay. the environmental allergy. So we've ruled out fleas. Um, we want to rule out mites, so we'll often recommend a skin scraping. Um, so we take a, a dull blade and kind of scrape the surface of the skin because the mites like uh, scabies and demodex kind of like to burrow in the top layers of the skin. And so if they're there, ideally we can see it if the clinical signs fit Where would you take well. that sample from? Any uh, lesions that we can find. So let's say there's like a red spot on the chest and one on the leg. We would take our samples from there because that's clearly where the dog is itchy and being bothered. Okay. Okay. And you do that by just taking then putting it underneath a microscope to mm -hmm. check it out. And then you, you look for the mites. Okay. Now um, the demodex mite um, or, or mange, demodex mange, mm -hmm. um, that tends to uh, be seen in puppies or animals with poor immune systems. It's okay. another one of those things that's normally there but in very low numbers. And so if the immune system is compromised, they can grow can and start. cause trouble. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, scabies, we don't see as often. That is, you know, very itchy, and it's harder to see on the skin scraping. Um, it, it's more um, diagnostic to look at kind of the clinical signs of the animal, like where they're itchy particularly. And there's a fun little trick you can do where if you kind of like massage their ear, and if they start like itching their foot, that's like 80% sensitive for diagnosing. Uh, scabies. Oh, and so um, the skin scraping, which is wonderful for the demodex mite, mm -hmm. isn't so hot for uh, the, the scabies or the sarcoptes mite. And so you'll notice we'll do some like other little things like this weird ear massage yeah, to see if they, if they start itching. Um, but there's been a lot of studies done on it and it's like 80% sensitive for, for diagnosing. Of it. all the things we've discussed so far, that also happens in cats. Mm -hmm. you can, are cats allergic to things? Yeah. Are rabbits? Mm -hmm. All the different animals like that, a lot of the domestic animals are, yeah, are like Yeah, but we see it most in dogs and in cats, dogs. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we talked about skin scraping, looking for mites, looking for fleas. The next piece of cytology, um, uh, we, call, we do like a tape test um, and an impression smear. So we're going to take a, a blank slide and any like nasty looking areas that are, are red and mm -hmm. inflamed or itchy. We're just going to take the slide and stick it on there and wiggle it around and pull it off. On the skin? On the, on the, on the skin. Okay, yeah. gotcha. And so if there's any bacteria or yeast there or inflammatory cells, we'll, we'll stain that slide, look at it under the microscope, and we'll see those things. Mm -hmm. Because if there's not a bacterial infection or a yeast infection, why would we put the dog on medication for that? So a lot of times, you know, people just say, well, can't you just put it on antibiotics? We could, but they might not need that. 
you know, and, and why, why medicate for something that we don't need to do. So that's, that's the reason behind, you know, diagnostics for everything, but especially in this case, because um, when we're talking about, you know, treating uh, some skin issues, it can be long courses of treatment, which is costly. It's, you know, um, changing the GI tract, uh, you know, all those sorts of things. So um, it's a super easy test that quickly tells us, is there bacteria there? Is there yeast there? Do we need to address it? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the tape test is very similar. We take a, a clear piece of tape, stick it on the lesion, and then put that on a slide. The advantage with that is for some lesions that don't have like a lot of oozing and gooey, nasty stuff, maybe a drier type of lesion, the tape kind of grabs onto those little things that we're looking for and puts it on the slide for us. The most vets offices do all this? Yeah. This is, this super, is super easy stuff they to do, do in house. This. Yeah, probably all of them. I mean, a uh, microscope slide and a scalpel blade, like every no hospital. Tough. They better have that. Every and tape. Every every yeah, okay. hospital has we that. Have, we all have around. that. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's that's the first round of diagnostics is ruling out any infection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it might be that the dog has a food allergy or an environmental allergy, which are our higher um, hierarchy in the testing scheme, but they already have a skin infection. Uh, and so a skin infection in itself can be itchy with like yeast or bacteria. And so we have to treat that first. So let's say we, we do our, our cytology and there's bacteria everywhere. Well, we have to address that because bacteria being there uh, is itchy. Sure. You know, a skin infection is itchy. So it could just be a, a straightforward skin infection, but until we get those bacteria gone, we can't really evaluate the other types of allergies um, without the, the, with the bacteria there, because it's just kind of confounding everything. Well, a lot of people go to something that's a little bit easier for them to take care of themselves, such as changing food and doing stuff like that before they jump to the veterinary clinic and say, mm -hmm. okay, fine. I mean, is it possible for me to say, let me think back over what I've seen or what changes have occurred. We've talked about that several times, that mm -hmm. you need for the person to keep track of what their yeah. dog's doing. And then maybe I can say, well, maybe it was food this time, maybe I can make a change or I can do something like mm -hmm. that but then they can always come to the veterinarians and, and get the additional tests. Yeah, okay. and uh, you know, in a situation like if there's an infection already there, like changing the food yeah. at home, it's not gonna make that like go away. No. So most of the time, if, if the dog has already started itching and there's already redness, like there's already something else going on, whether it was the primary problem or kind of a secondary problem. Most of the time, if there's, you know, if there's a food or an environmental al allergy, the skin infection is secondary to it. So if we find infection, we address that first. Okay. If we don't find skin, skin infection, we go to the next step. Um, if we found infection, we address it, and then when they come back in, we go to the next step. Talk to the next possible. Okay. okay. So um, we've ruled out all of our infections. Uh, the contact allergy, I haven't talked much about that, but that's kind of like a history thing, you know, like mm -hmm. did your dog come in contact with like a chemical or, you know, something, something like that. Like that. Okay. So okay. there's nothing like super fancy to Wait do for that. Hey, I know. What about, um, can they have allergies to the lawn stuff that's put on people's lawns? Yeah, I, I've seen dogs react to that. Um, because usually, that, would that be contact? Yeah, it's In usually it's more um, they're like licking it. Um, yeah. So like the stuff's out there and they lick it and they get like oral irritation. Um, but they can certainly have, you know, skin reactions to it as well. Okay. So um, we've ruled out fleas, we ruled out bacterial uh, skin infections, mm -hmm. yeast skin infections, uh, mites. If any of those were there, we treated them. And now we're ready to go to the next step in our, in our diagnostic tree. And that's food allergies. Um, so the best test uh, for food allergies, the best diagnostic, is what we call a food trial. Um, and that basically means that we pick a, a particular diet, which we'll talk about more in a second, and we put the dog on that for a period of time, at least uh, eight weeks. It's a long time. It's a long time. And all they get during that eight weeks is the food and the treats that go with it. Um, no other treats, no human food. Um, we have to watch out for like heartworm preventions that have like beef flavoring, stuff like that. If they get any of that, anything. it ruins the whole thing. So why do eight we, weeks is a heck of a long time. That dog's been doing a lot of itching in eight weeks. Well, here's the, the reason behind it. So the diets that we're picking can either be a novel protein, which means a protein that they've never, the dog has never been exposed to. So it tends to be things like uh, venison, kangaroo, oh, okay. stuff like that. Kangaroo? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so um, 
I think you make this stuff up. No, it's, it's real. <laughs> There's actually dog food that has yeah. kangaroo meat in it? Yeah, the kangaroos are farmed in, in Australia like beef cattle are here. Oh my heavens, all right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think you throw these things in sometimes just to see if I'm missing Just to spice it, it up yes, a little bit. Yes, yes, and I'm saying kangaroo, my gosh, I've never heard of that. Okay, keep and, going. And so <laughs> the idea behind that novel protein diet is that we're giving them a protein that has never been in any dog food that they've ever had okay. before. So if they have a chicken allergy or a beef allergy or a pork allergy, whatever it may be, if that's the cause of their allergy, if you get rid of that stimulus, that pork or beef or whatever, and substitute it with like venison, protein in the food, then their allergy, if it's a food allergy, their allergy should go away. Okay. Okay. And we have to do it for the eight weeks because we already know that they're having a reaction. So we have to give the immune system time to kind of like back off and heal. And the skin kind of turnover is like three weeks. So like the, the top layer of skin, if you like killed that right now, it takes like 21 days for it to totally like regenerate. So you can kind of see why we have to have this eight week long period. Does this constitute a trip by me to Australia? To no. get the kangaroo? Uh, we, we can get them here. You can get stuff? Yeah. Come on. So we, we have uh, the venison diet. Is well, the I one, knew that. Is the one that we go to. Okay, uh, I was but, say. Uh, when I was I, thinking about a trip maybe. <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose you could do that. I guess I could. As an I excuse. Could, I could. I but uh, down at um, the uh, PVSCC, the specialty hospital in sure. Pittsburgh, when I was on my dermatology externship there, they had the kangaroo uh, diet. Um, wow. And so that, that was what they recommended, and they had special treats that went with it. And uh, we have Hills Food here, and they have the venison product, and it's the same thing. They have treats that can So Hills well. makes a uh, food that has, is basically venison. Yeah, it's uh, venison and sweet potato, I think. Really? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So that's, that's one option for the foods is the novel protein. The other option is a, a hydrolyzed protein. And what that means is they take a regular protein, chicken uh, in this case, and they use a special process to basically, if, if we have the protein, they dice it up into little pieces on like a microscopic level. And so what this does is, if this is like the receptor in the GI tract that's kind of getting the, the chicken molecule and causing this big reaction. Mm -hmm. So normally, you know, it, if this is the protein, the chicken protein comes in and it triggers this reaction, right? All right. By making it really small, you know, now we just have like this little protein coming in and it, it can't bind in, in this big receptor and so it just kind of goes out and it doesn't trigger that reaction. And so that's the science behind that one. Um, some dogs don't seem to like the, the taste of the hydrolyzed protein as much. Um, it is a little bit cheaper than like the kangaroo and the mm -hmm. venison. So we'll often start there, um, but if the, if the dog won't eat the food, then oftentimes we have to go to right. one of the novel protein diets. Some people just start off at the novel protein diet and say, there's a 50-50 chance your dog's not gonna like it. Why waste time and money? Just go on, with that. on the hydrolyzed one. Right. So, you know, it, it's a preference on the doctor's part and the owner's part, however they want to go about Can it. Can I just change the food in general? Like if I'm on a certain brand that I buy at uh, the pet store or something, mm -hmm. Can I just say, you know what? And people do this all the time. I think I'm just going to change the food. Yeah. So well, my friend says that my their dog had allergies and they went to this food. Mm -hmm. People just seem to be switching all the yeah. time. So there's kind of two reasons why um, I think that's not ideal. Okay. One reason is you know people will say, well, let's say the dog has a, a chicken allergy, mm -hmm. and they'll go and they'll find something uh, and they're looking for something exotic and they're like, oh, this has duck in it. You know, right. that's a novel protein, we right? That. Yes. Like my dog's never eaten duck. But if you look at the data, there's actually a lot of similarities between chicken and duck, duck. protein. Yes, they're, they're different, but there are some similarities. And so there have been some studies that have shown that um, a dog with a chicken allergy gets the duck diet and still has the reaction because of, there are some similarities in the protein. All you have to do is sit around with people that, whose dogs have allergies. And everybody has one of 50 different ways that yeah. they're, they're trying to cure it. Mm -hmm. Well, I did this, and I did the sweet potatoes, and I did this, and I did that. And by the time you're done, you say, well, now what do I do? I have no clue what I'm doing. Yeah. So they really do better to come to a veterinarian and get yeah, a we can take this, control this than just going. Approach. Yeah, a lot of people just walk down the aisle at the pet store and say, hmm, haven't had that one for a while. Maybe that'll do it. Mm -hmm. Get that one. Then when this one doesn't work and they just bought 20 pounds right. and it doesn't work, they say, okay, I'll go to the next one. Mm -hmm. So you really need to go to your local veterinarian and try and do it a little bit more controlled than just yeah. 
walking the aisles of the pet store. Right. And so, and then the other reason is um, the prescription diets that we're recommending, you mm -hmm. know, the, the Hills diet with the venison or the other with the kangaroo, those are produced in, in like very strict conditions. Right. So there's no cross contamination. And so something that you're picking up, you know, over the counter, you can't ensure that there hasn't been any cross contamination. Whereas, you know, at the, the companies that are making these prescription foods, they guarantee that, that that, that food is made only and that's in, in this and place. The whole thing is controlled. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of the, the other, you know, advantage to it. Hmm. Um, so for to rule out food allergy, we're doing the diet trial with either a novel protein or a hydrolyzed protein. If the dog has a food allergy, it will go away. That's good news. That'd be, that'd be and, and that's nice. It doesn't always happen. Um, now, there's one more step to that, which a lot of people end up not taking, and that's to reintroduce the old food uh, to say that like it truly was a food allergy um, and not just kind of a, a fluke that the dog just happened to get better at the same time. We've already done eight weeks mm -hmm. of this one thing, and now you're telling me at the end of eight weeks we could now consider for a little bit of time going back to the original dog food and yeah. starting to introduce that. And it's just like for a day. Um, and so the oh, it's not like for another no four no no no, or six no. Weeks. It, it's just okay. like All it's right. just like a trial because if it was truly a food allergy as soon as you put them back on the old food right away. their skin's gonna flare up again now most people say to me look this is the first time in like three years that my dog hasn't been itching and chewing and licking and keeping us up all night and we're not stepping on saliva spots on the floor <laughs> and we aren't hearing scratching all the time. They're like, I'm just gonna keep them on the food because it's working. Right. And I can't really argue with that. But in theory, you're supposed to challenge them with the old diet to really truly confirm. The thing that is worse than waking up at night and hearing your dog scratching yeah. or licking. Uh huh. Licking their feet forever. Right. All night long and you're yelling, stop licking, stop licking, or mm -hmm. throw them in another room and it just never goes away. Yeah. It's constant. Okay. Uh, there is um, one other way of testing for food allergy, but uh, it's not recommended. You can do um, like serology or blood testing for it. Mm -hmm. And all the dermatologists cringe at those tests because they're, so, they're not reliable at all. And so I have, you know, a lot of people come in with like an allergy testing report and like, you know, um, his allergy testing came back and he was allergic to soy and chicken and, and beef and potato and all of these things. And you just kind of have to be like, I'm sorry, but those just aren't really accurate at right. all. And the, the assays, the, the tests are wonderful for environmental allergies, which we'll talk about in a second. But for food allergy, they're just, they're abysmal. They, it just is bad information. Uh, and so um, I don't give a lot of credit to those. And I know the, the dermatologists that I studied with they get that report and just totally toss Goodbye. out that Forget sheet. This. They focus on, you know, the environmental stuff, absolutely, but sure. the food thing, it's, it's not worth the time of day. Hmm. And there's so many food ones out there, my God. Mm -hmm. Could be any combination of any one of the manufacturers. Yeah. But the thing to remember really? is that for a food allergy, it's usually the protein. And so, the, like I said, in, it's controversial, but in general, you know, the soy, the grain, the corn, the potato, like that's not the cause of a dog's food allergy, it's the protein. So you, instead of spending, you know, $400 on a, a blood test mm -hmm. for it, you can spend, you know, 50, 60 bucks on a bag of food for eight weeks. And as long as you can, you know, keep all, the family on board with not giving it other things, then, you know, that's, that's an easy test to do. For some people it is, for others it's really hard because they're feeding constantly. Yeah. Okay, what's our next step? And thing so else? the final one, uh, let's say we do, we rule out all the infection. Mm -hmm. That was our first step. Our second step was to rule out the food allergy. We did our eight weeks on the venison diet. He's still itching, scratching, whatever. And so now we go to environmental allergies. Um, and the main test that we do uh, here is a blood test or serology. Um, so we spin the blood down, take the serum portion off, send that off to the lab. And they're basically looking for antibodies in the dog's blood to, um, you know, oak pollen or blue orchard grass or whatever it that, may be. Does that cost a lot? That's uh, more expensive. I would think so. Yeah. Um, but it's going to get you an answer. The other way to test um, is uh, 
intradermal skin testing. And so they do this in people too, where they, they make like a grid uh, on the side of the dog. Yeah. And then they go through with little vials of different antigens, different allergies, and they inject a small amount in and they, they label it all on a sheet. And then, you know, they go back at a period of time later and look at it. And if it just looks like normal skin, the dog's not allergic to that. If it's all red and irritated and angry, they're allergic to just it. Just like on a person when you get the yeah. allergy test. Right. Now, we don't do that here because you have to mix up all those different allergens and they don't keep very long. And so that's something um, where we often refer to the dermatologist to down do. In, probably down, 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 in, down, down in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh. Um, and so it's either, you know, the, the serology testing here or the skin testing down there. Now at any point, or for really severe cases, we might say, look, this is a really bad allergy. You know, we're doing all the right things here, but um, we're not getting, you know, good answers or not good response. And so at any time we might recommend referral, you know, down there if it seems like an unusual case or, or something like that. Do people like really that. do that? Mm -hmm. Spend all that money to have their dog go down there and have all that testing? I mean, if your dog is keeping you up all night, yeah. every night, licking and chewing, <laughs> and you're dropping hundreds of dollars yes. every month for antibiotics and anti-itching mm -hmm. medications, mm -hmm. I mean, if you can go down there, and, you know, for it's it's costly, sure, but if that changes all of that, like I, it's hard to argue with, know. you know, going. But yeah, it it is costly. And so, uh, like I said, we tend to do the serology here, uh, and we can uh, do a couple of things with that. Um, there's a treatment called immunotherapy or allergy vaccines is kind of a more common term, and so they can take that data that says. Um, She's allergic to dust mites and orchard grass. Mm -hmm. And they can make basically... What kind of grass is that? Orchard. Is I'm, that? I'm just picking a random grass. Oh, I never even heard of that. Yeah, okay. I don't know. Bermuda grass, we don't have it around here. Is that like Australia? <laughs> <laughs> the kangaroo. Okay, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> um, Orchard grass is where I stopped you. <laughs> yeah. So they, they can take that, that data and make basically an allergy vaccine mm -hmm. that you give at home, and it tricks the dog's uh, immune system into fighting off those allergies instead of making this exaggerated skin response to it. Is that it. by shot or is that by pill? Or? There, there's two ways. One is a shot, okay, okay and that's um, once a month typically, uh, like once they get um, on schedule. And then there's also um, a drop that you can give under the tongue, uh, and uh -huh. but that's twice a day. Um, so the pros and cons. Um, yes. The injection, you know, is potentially, you know, once a month or once every two weeks or something. So uh, less frequency. Um, but that's the one that's expensive. Is that the allergy that's shots. Just, yes. Um, once you get it, once you get all the data going, I don't think it's too bad. Okay. There was something I had an option on something. It was like a hundred over a hundred and fifty dollars. It was something. Yeah. Shot. Maybe and, and, for that though. Um, I don't remember now. The downside is that you have to, you know, inject your dog. Some people are uncomfortable right. doing that at home. Some people it doesn't bother them. Uh, the drops, the nice thing is you don't have to poke your dog, sure. um, but you have to give it daily. Um, so that might be a con for some people. Um, some dermatologists argue that the uh, oral drops are slightly more effective than the injection. And so that might be another pro for that, yeah. but um, I don't know, you know how much uh, data and stuff is out there on that. But um, just in, in conversation with some different dermatologists, some of them prefer the, the oral the drops, drops over the injection. Um, and, and so uh, that's treatment that we can get from uh, that information of allergy testing. Now, I said that the, the allergy testing is horrible for food allergies, right? Uh, it's good for environmental aller allergies, but you still have to in interpret it correctly. So um, if it comes back that the dog is allergic to Bermuda grass and the dog is in northwestern Pennsylvania 365 days a year, you have to be like, how is that possible? The dog's Bermuda grass is like in Florida. Right. The dog's never left, you know, this our little corner of the state. How how is it possibly allergic to mm -hmm. Bermuda grass? Because for the for the test to be positive, they have to be exposed to the allergen once to make that response. So if they've never been exposed to it, you have to say, I think that's a false positive. Yeah, false. But if it comes back as dust mites or, you know, something that we have around here, and if it fits with the history, you know, if it's all pollens and stuff and all of those pollens are active like spring to summer transition mm -hmm. and that's what comes up on the test is all those particular pollens and you can say all right I, I, I think this is accurate this makes sense but if it comes back as you know super 
random things that the dog couldn't possibly have been exposed to, then it, you know it's the doctor's job to kind of say, all right, I think that's yeah, probably think that's a false right. positive. Okay. So the the dermatologists always stress that um, the the allergy test is you know mostly the interpretation on the doctor's mm -hmm. part with the history. Um, that makes the biggest difference with that test versus just it being like a wonderful test all on its own. Okay. Okay. Um, so if it's a food allergy, if, if there's infection, we're going to treat the infection. If it's food allergy, we're going to switch the food. If it's an environmental allergy, uh, we talked about uh, the allergy injection or the drops, mm -hmm. and that's one option. Um, with any of with any environmental allergy, we know that there's a, a defect in the skin barrier. So the skin is part of our immune system, right? It's a protective mm -hmm. barrier. And uh, some recent data has suggested that dogs with environmental allergies actually have like these fine little cracks in their skin. It's microscopic, you can't see it. But it's big enough that it actually lets those like little pollens through and kind of trips, you know, that reaction or whatever the, right. the allergy might be. And so there's some other foods out there um, or there's uh, supplements um, that can help kind of mend those little cracks and crevices. Um, so there, there's a special food that can help with that. Um, there are some supplements that are anti-inflammatory, uh, like fatty acids, uh, like fish oils, um, mm -hmm. vitamin E, stuff like that that we'll often recommend. Uh, and there are shampoos that can also help with uh, that skin barrier defect. It kind of puts like a protective layer on the skin. Uh, and then some of those shampoos are antimicrobial or anti-yeast, and so if there's uh, flare-ups or infection, we can also use those things as kind of more of a topical uh, treatment. Can you get that over the counter in a pet store? Uh, most of them it? are prescription, prescription? Uh, because they have, uh, you know, like an antibiotic or an antifungal. Um, and if you use it on a regular dog, it could throw things in the opposite direction. Oh, okay. So usually you have to get those from, from your vet. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk about some other alternatives to environmental allergies other than the shots and the oral drops. Um, you used to hear, you know, uh, back in the day that dogs with allergies got prednisone. Notice we haven't mentioned prednisone at all yet. No. Isn't that lovely? Um, so prednisone um, is a steroid, and uh, at different doses it does uh, different things. Um, and so it can be used as an anti-inflammatory, and typically um, with allergies that's what we're doing, but it can also cause some immune system suppression which sometimes is also needed if the, if the immune system is really going, you're trying to quiet it down so we don't have this inappropriate skin response. And so when you give prednisone for an allergy, it works. The itching stops, the redness goes away because you're quieting down the immune system, right? right. But it's a steroid, so it's not really ideal. The dog's going to drink all the time, urinate all the time. It's going to be ravenously hungry. Um, it can cause liver problems, um, diabetes, you know, things like that. But that what, was the go-to for a long time. That was time. the go-to for the long time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if there's like a small flare-up, let's say it's like a flea allergy, um, I'll often reach for, you know, prednisone for that because I, only, I know the dog's going to be on it for you know, like three days at kind of the full dose, and then I'm just going to start tapering off. I just need to break that itch cycle, okay. you know. Because that's what it becomes, too. Right. Sometimes they're itching, and it seems like, my God, they're being Yeah, no and, and you know, if there's inflammation <clears throat> and the dog itches, that makes more inflammation, sure. which makes it itchier, and so they itch more, and it makes they're more inflammation, and it's the cycle. So we call that the itch cycle. And so sometimes we'll use prednisone, even still today, to break that itch mm -hmm. cycle. Um, I also will use it like if we're doing the food allergy trial and they're super itchy, I don't want them to go eight weeks being miserable. <laughs> so we'll do a lower dose just to kind of take the edge off yeah. uh, until the food can kind of get in there and do its thing. Um, but in general, we don't like to use that uh, anymore. Um, and so that's all I'm going to say about it because I, I don't like it for skin issues. Uh, you don't hear much about it anymore for that. Yeah. Now there's a, a newer medication out. Um, that we can use. It's called Apoquil, and it's kind of the latest and greatest thing in dog allergies. How, why did that suddenly come to the forefront? Well, because um, some scientists finally figured out uh, the very specific molecule that triggers the, the canine environmental allergy. So remember how I said that prednisone is kind of suppressing the entire mm -hmm. immune system, which is why they stop itching? Uh, these researchers found that there's a very specific signaling molecule that the immune system produces that is responsible for it. So this Apoquil medication only targets that 
very specific signaling molecule. So the pollen comes in or the dust mite, you know, antigen comes in and that signal doesn't get sent because that very specific carrier molecule doesn't go out. Whereas with prednisone, yeah, it's stopping that specific signaling molecule, but it's also stopping everything else sure. too. And so um, that's why that just came out because they just finally figured it out. Um, it's been out for a few years now, um, but it wasn't available in large quantities. So like some of the dermatologists would be able to get it, you know, a few years back. But in general distribution, they just weren't making enough of but it. But now they are. And now they are making enough um, to keep up with it. So um, it's kind of the latest and greatest thing, but we, st we have to be careful with it because it is still technically an immunosuppressive medication, right? It it's stopping a portion. All albeit a very small portion of the immune system, but it's an immunosuppressive. But it's not a steroid. It's not a steroid. Um, so the, it's labeled you know, for use um, for like up to 14 days um, to uh, help with um, environmental allergy-induced itching. And for most dogs, it works uh, really well. Um, we can have dogs on it longer than that, but we have to keep in mind that um, there haven't been a lot of long-term studies yet to see if anything happens long term. Can you stop that all, of it, all at once mm -hmm. or do you taper that off or if you've given it and it's working and then the dog starts licking again, can you start it off? Yeah, so I've, I've had some good success with it for dogs that have like seasonal mm -hmm. allergies and so every fall, you know, the person says, oh, she gets itchy. And so we can use it, you know, for two weeks right. or so, get them through their seasonal allergy and then take them off of it. What if you keep them on it longer? Well, that's the big question. Um, so some dogs, um, uh, I should take a step back to the, the allergy injections and say that those can take up to six months to work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even then they might not totally, n none of this may totally get rid of the allergy. We're just trying to control it, which is why it's such a frustrating disease to treat. So six months. So a lot of people, you know, come in and say, look, my dog's 10 years old. I don't know if I want to invest the, the, money. the money in the sure. testing and wait six months to see if it's going to work to have them, you know, pass away in a year or something. So let's try the That's, that's an argument, argument I hear. And we try the Apoquil and it works. And if it, the dog comes off, they're mi like they're miserable. And so in some situations, you know, we, we keep them on it long term. But the big question is, does it have any long term effects that we don't know about yet? Yeah. And with any immunosuppressive, you worry about like cancers and, and things like that. So I don't think there's any reports out or anything like that. You know, nobody's really noticing any trends. but just in theory, uh, physiologically, that, that could be a possible consequence. But. Something like Apoquil, can you give that like every other day or every third day? Or? We usually start it twice a day and then go down to once a day. And then can you do less than that every other and then? Uh, I think most, work that well? the, for as quickly as it acts and gets metabolized, uh, once a day is about, I think, as low as you, as you can, can go. Okay. Yeah. But again, you know, it's newer, so hopefully more studies will come out. People will look into things like that and mm -hmm. say, oh, look, like for some dogs, you can go to, you know, every other day or twice right. a week or, or something like that. So your recommendation is, so I bring my dog in and the dog's up on the table and I'm saying my dog's got some real issues. It's licking the feet all the time and mm -hmm. whatever. You're going to start asking me all those questions. You're yep. gonna, and, and I should, as we've talked before, should be keeping track of stuff mm -hmm. and I should know whenever I come in. I might have to look at that food bag. Yeah. To make sure that I See know what's, what's in, there. in the food because I don't know right now. So I should know that. I should know, you know, that when do they do it? Do they do it when they come in from outside? Yeah. Does it last for a long time? And, and think big picture too. Like, is it every, you know, fall? Is it, you know, right. constant year round? Um, is it when the, the furnace comes on every year? Mm -hmm. You know, stuff like that is helpful too. And then we go from there and then we can decide, we can go through the whole thing as to where yeah. the allergy is from. Right. And so we'll do our, we yeah, we'll do our physical exam. And if there's any lesions, then we can start saying, all right, well, let's, let's take a look at these. Is there bacteria there? Mm -hmm. Is there yeast there? Are there fleas anywhere? Are there any signs of mites? We can do that first, you know, tier of testing. Um, and then we can kind of go on up the hierarchy from there. And, you know, the whole time, even though we're doing these different tests, we still want the dog to be comfortable. So we right. might be, you know, if there's infection, we'll be giving an antibiotic. We might be trying to break the itch cycle with prednisone or the Apoquil. Um, so we're, you know, we're 
trying to make them happy while we're trying to figure out what the exact cause is too. So the local veterinarian here can do an awful lot of this and let's talk real quickly because we don't sometimes give enough attention to PVSEC. Tell us what that is because mm -hmm. I know you did some yeah. work down there and uh, where it's located and what mm -hmm. it does. It's a Pittsburgh Veterinary Specialty and Emergency Center. Right. It's a mouthful. Um, and it's um, uh, one of the closest veterinary specialty referral centers. So it's the equivalent of um, you go to Meadville Medical Center, they say, oh, look, you got this, um, but the, the best person to take care of it is up in Erie or down in Pittsburgh. Or even Cleveland Clinic or, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, PVSEC is kind of the, uh, the dog equivalent or dog and mm -hmm. cat equivalent mm -hmm. to, to that. And so, um, you know, if it's a younger dog with horrible allergies or um, if it's just, if it's kind of weird, you know, something's not quite right and, and the vet thinks that um, it's not a, a straightforward case, we might recommend going down there because right. they see very weird, very difficult things all the time. Well, they have, uh, talking about them very quickly, they have a huge cancer program down there. I know yeah. they have the eye. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dr. Bagley walks on water as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. He's the greatest. They have that whole section on the dermatology. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got um, the emergency. Emergency, cardiology, um, neurology, uh, internal medicine. They've got a radiologist on staff. Right. Um, Iron 15 minutes away from Meadville. Yeah, is all it is. It's right. It's right after the yeah, right after the 279 split by that big giant eagle Home Depot. Right. So you go down 79, go to 279, and then when you get to the first exit at the giant eagle and Home Depot, it's, it's right uh, there. Camp Horn Road, I Camp think. Camp Horn Road. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Yeah, and, and uh, they do wonderful work. Um, we get people from Ohio too, so I usually either refer to Pittsburgh or to the um, Metro Veterinary Specialty Hospital in, in Akron. <laughs> and uh, they, they do good work over there. I don't think they have a dermatologist though, but um, I spent time in the dermatology uh, unit at PVSEC mm -hmm. and it was fantastic. I learned all the stuff that we you know talked about today um, and uh, they, do, they do a great job. And give me a guess, out of 100 dogs, how many dogs do you think would have issues with allergies? <sighs> That, that's hard to say. Are, no, they, are they all pit bulls and golden retrievers? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of golden retrievers in there. A lot of dogs have it though, especially, well, yeah. maybe the environmental one, especially. Yeah. Because that one mm -hmm. does come around pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But something definitely, if you've got a dog that's uncomfortable, especially if the dog's inside, I guess they could have a lot of these conditions and be outside and you'd probably never know it. Yeah. Because they're itching and what do you care? They're outside itching mm -hmm. and the whole and, thing. And the ones we, that are in the house, in the bedroom, itching at night or licking at night that yeah. puts you over the edge or scratching the ear. Or right. Or you hear else. like the, the paw like thumping oh, the yes. ground, you know? Yes, yes. That's whenever <laughs> you know you've got an issue. Yeah. Uh, anything else we need to add to this? I think that's that's the bulk of it. You know, there's all sorts of other little um, treatments and things that, that people do, um, but... Uh, the biggest thing is finding out what's causing it. Right. Um, and as far as the, the first tier, the cytology, looking for infection, and the food trial, I mean, those are easy. Right. So everybody should go see their veterinarian and get some help if they need help with this. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, thanks very much. I appreciate your help. Anytime. Good discussion, and I hope everybody enjoys it. See you the next time. All right.